Okay, um, let's talk about the assignments for a moment. Uh, I know that some of you are struggling with uh, assignment five, and I think the ones that are struggling are those that are new to C, and particularly those of you that are new to C++. Um, there are uh, small but important differences between C and C++. One of them that I noticed came up in the uh, subreddit feed uh, yesterday. <clears throat> a lot of the errors uh, that some of you are encountering have to do with variable scope. So if you go and have a look at the ragdoll demo, you'll notice that uh, there's a header file and a CPP file. So let's have a look here. If I open the uh, header file for the ragdoll demo, you'll notice that ragdoll demo is actually a class. So this is a data structure that contains both variables and uh, functions, which in C++ are called methods. So inside this class, or belonging to this class, are a number of variables that you see here, and a number of functions or methods that are defined in the header file, or declared in the header file, and then defined or filled in in the .cp CPP file. So now uh, in class ragdoll at the top there, uh, we have some more defined variables, and you'll notice here, ragdoll, this is the constructor or the function that's called whenever an instance of this class is created, and you can see that this is where all the magic happens, right? All the geoms that make up the ragdoll are defined first, and then the bodies that make up the ragdoll are defined after that point. So if you're getting errors when you're compiling, saying I can't find this or that variable, make sure it's in scope, meaning you're, calling, you're creating your functions that belong to the ragdoll demo class, and they're calling variables that also belong to that class. So the simplest way to do things is make sure that all your variables and functions belong to the ragdoll class. I think that should clear up a lot of the pro remaining issues that you're all having. Make sense? If you're still confused, go and watch uh, or go take a C++ tutorial online. Okay, so that's assignment five. Let's talk about assignment six now, which was assigned uh, last night and will be due next Monday evening. So very much like in assignment five, when you were adding one part of the robot to the simulation at a time, you added nine body parts. Now you're going to be adding eight joints that connect neighboring pairs of body parts together. Assignment six is a little more challenging than assignment five, because in assignment six, when you add a joint, you can't actually see it in the simulator. The joints themselves are invisible, right? So the nice thing about adding bodies is if you get the position or the size or the orientation wrong, when you compile and run it, you immediately see that. If you put a joint in the wrong place or you create the normal for that joint in the wrong way, you won't see it directly. Your robot will act strangely, but you won't know exactly why. So this is why I had you do things in such an incremental fashion in assignment five. You're going to do the same thing in assignment six, add one joint at a time, and look, there, there's going to be hints to look for to make sure that you've got the joint in exactly the right place and with the right joint normal. Make sense? Okay. So as you've probably found out uh, for, by now, at the end of assignment five, when you run the simulation, everything falls apart because, of course, the nine body parts are not attached together. First screenshot for assignment six, you're going to be attaching the right lower leg to the right upper leg. So you're adding the elbow or knee joint, if you like, right here. And you can see that I put the joint in the right place because if we look to the left, these two pieces are still falling and are, are physically separated from one another. But we've now added a, a hinge joint here that pins these two pieces together. So now when weight acts on the right upper leg and the right upper leg starts to fall downward, it's attached here so it swings inwards towards the right lower leg 
and then will eventually fall, fall over because not everything is attached yet. Right? So I can immediately tell from this animation and even from this image that the joint is in the right place and the joint normal is in the right place. So this will also help you build up an intuition for joint normals. Remember that a joint normal points perpendicularly to the plane through which you want the neighboring objects to rotate. Right? So if I want these two pieces to rotate through the vertical plane, I, I define my joint normal to point out of that plane. If I want these two objects to rotate through the horizontal plane, then I define the joint normal for this joint to point vertically, because then this vector points perpendicularly to the horizontal plane through which I want the neighboring body parts to rotate. So far, so good? OK. So here I've added one of the knees here. In screenshot two, I've added in the other three knees. So you can see that the upper and lower parts of each of the four legs uh, are attached to one another, but they're still physically separated from the main body. Now I've added in the right hip joint, if you like. So now the right leg is attached to the main body. Main body is attached to the upper leg with a hinge joint, and the upper leg is attached to the lower leg with a hinge joint. The other three legs are still physically separated from the main body. Right? So visibly, myself or the TA can see that you're incrementally adding the joints. They're in the right position, and they have the right joint normals. Once you've added all eight joints, the robot should slowly settle onto the ground, and its legs splay out vertically. The final step in assignment six is you're going to add joint limits to each of the eight joints so that they can only rotate 45 degrees inward or upward or 45 degrees in the other direction. So now when the robot settles, you can see that the four hip joints are, are being passively rotated 45 degrees upward. And these legs here have also settled out. So even though we're creating them at a 90 degree angle, remember that the instant you create a joint, that defines the angle between these two objects by default to be zero. So minus 45 is pulling in towards the body, and plus 45 degrees is pushing a little bit out. Right? So it will no longer lie flat because it's not as flexible as it was before. OK, so these five images together will show us that you've got all eight joints in the right place. The, correct, the normals are all pointing in the, in the correct direction, and you have the correct joint limits on all of them. They can only rotate inward towards the body by 45 degrees or outward from the body by 45 degrees. Sound good? Okay, good luck. Okay, let's uh, jump back to the schedule for a moment. <clears throat> All right, we're working our way through the history of evolutionary robotics, and we're looking at a series of ex experiments which have collectively become known as minimal cognition experiments. A lot of what we see in evolutionary robotics experiments are sensor motor coordination tasks, legged locomotion, object manipulation. These are all well and good for robotics, but our long-term goal uh, obviously is to make adaptive and ultimately intelligent machines. So can we evolve not just sensor coordination, sensor motor coordination tasks, but can we gradually evolve our robots to become more and more sophisticated so they start to incorporate and exhibit the building blocks of cognition? And we've been looking at a number of these building blocks so far. What were the three building blocks we looked at last time? We were looking at the Space Invaders robot along the bottom of the screen. We were looking at affordances, right? So as a robot or we look out in the world, we recognize objects by understanding the functionalities they advertise or afford to us, right? This thing is for sitting. This thing is for putting something flat and writing on it. This thing is actually for 
writing, right? Recognizing affordances. What else uh, do we look at? Self, not self distinction. Exactly, right? Seems trivial to us, but remember that thinking about thinking is misleading. It's actually not a trivial thing to know where your body ends and the world begins. How would a robot actually figure out what is under its control and what, what isn't? Okay, what else do we look at? Detecting affordances, discriminating between self and non-self. What was the third building block that we finished with last time? Short-term memory. Short-term memory, right? You have to be able to remember things. So let's jump back to uh, lecture nine now. We're going to look at the fourth and the final building block in this series of experiments. And uh, these experiments were done a while ago. So unfortunately, investigators did not make videos of these robots. I had a student who took this course a few years ago. He re-implemented uh, this work in a physics engine and managed to evolve a robot that succeeds at the fourth building block we're going to look at now. And this is a video from David Buckingham's uh, project. What building block of cognition are we looking at here? Actually, we're looking at several of them. This is much more challenging than the three we've seen so far. prioritizing which object to go after first. So this is known as selective attention, which our society is now wrestling with, right? You have lots of things that are vying for your attention. Should you be listening to your brilliant professor or checking your, your Facebook feed, right? How do you know what to attend to, when, under what circumstances, and when do you know, when should you pull your attention away from something and attend to something else. This is known as selective attention, which as you can imagine, and as you probably know through personal experience, not a trivial thing to, to do, right? So selective attention is, of course, a building block of cognition, but it itself is made up of simpler building blocks, some of which we've already talked about. What are some of the simpler building blocks you can see this robot tackling as it exhibits selective attention? Memory, because if it's too far out, it has to remember that it once saw it, so that it's going to be there. Absolutely, right? So there's memory involved. So this robot, as it moves, we don't turn off the sensors like we just did in the memory experiment that we just saw. But these seven ray sensors often move away from, from the object, so it no longer can see one of the objects, goes and captures the other one, and has to remember and come back and grab the other one. Um, it's not self, not self identification, but being able to remember two things as being distinct, like two um, objects as being two objects. Absolutely. How does it even know that there's two objects? You can see in this video feed here, at some points, the two objects are overlapping from the robot's limited sensorium here. How does it even know that there are two, two objects? Okay, this is obviously one of the more challenging projects you can tackle, but not, not impossible. Okay, so let's have a look at this task in a little more detail now. So going back to uh, the reading for, for this lecture, the fourth and final building block here, they did not do this in a physics engine. They did this in this, in this much simpler two-dimensional uh, simulator here, but basically the same task. So same thing we've seen before. They're going to evolve a population of C tier and Ns. They're going to drop any given C tier and N into the robot multiple times. And each time they do, they're going to drop a pair of objects from the top of the screen. They're going to have different initial positions. They're going to fall at different directions with different velocities. Someone walk me through the fitness function here. This one's pretty straightforward. Uh, 
How are they evolving here or rewarding for more or less selective attention? <coughs> How close it came to the moving disks when they were at the same uh, x. Exactly. So when, when one of the objects hit the ground, at that point, take the horizontal distance between the robot and that object at that time, right? So the different pair of objects are going to hit the ground at different times. And whenever you do, make sure that make sure that the robot is there to capture, capture it, right? Pretty straightforward fitness function. Remember again, if you look at this fitness function, there's nothing in here that says recognize the objects, distinguish between them, pay attention to the faster object, then pay attention to the slower object. There's none of that, right? We're just evolving what we want the robot to do. How the robot evolves to do it, that's up to, to evolution. Okay. So I showed you the video, now you've seen how this works. You can place pairs of objects that make this problem harder or easier. And we're going to characterize different, uh, uh, different pairs of objects according to the passing objects problem and the objects permanent permanence problem. So the passing objects problem is the object that originally started further away. There's higher in the screen. So from the ro robot's point of view, don't worry about the one that's higher up. But it turns out that as it's falling, it's falling faster than the initially closer object. So they're going to pass one another as they're falling at some point. And the robot should realize that and go after the one that is now falling faster. Is it OK for the robot to wait until it detects that passing situation? So in essence, maybe a good strategy is just go after whichever object is closer. Is that sufficient here? Why not? Well, I mean, if you just go for whichever object is closer, uh, and then you have a passing object each time that object does pass, you're going to end up with a pretty bad fitness function. Why, why are you going to end up with a bad fitness function? Because you're going to be missing one of the disks entirely. Uh, you might. So if they're falling and the faster one passes this one, and now you go after this one because it's closer, mm -hmm. you might still be OK. I was thinking that like, if it was trying to go after like, the one that's closer, and then it, the one that's farther away that passes like, moves out of the range of that's it. Absolutely. Hey, that's a good point, right? So they're, they're falling, and it goes after this one, and the robot is heading off after this one. This one passes. It's falling over here. The robot forgets about it or doesn't attend to it and, and misses it, right? So it's not, not enough to just go after the closer object. The robot is somehow going to have to attend to or pay attention to position, relative velocity, height, its own position, and so on, right? There's a lot of kind of factors here for a robot to, to juggle. There's also the object permanence problem, which we've already seen. As you chase after one of the objects, the second object may pass outside your field of view, right? And you're going to have to remember where, roughly where that object is so you can head back and find it again after you've caught the first one. Okay. All right, so let's have a look at five different conditions. So again, what we're watching here is one evolved CTRNN that has successfully managed to evolve the ability to selectively attend. Let's place pairs of objects and see how it does. Let's start with a simple case here where we have neither the passing objects problem nor the object permanence problem. And let's see if we can try and understand these figures here. So time is on the vertical axis here, and each trapezoid that you see here corresponds to one of the pairs of objects. What is the dashed line back, or what is the, uh, the rugged line here going back and forth? What does that represent? It's the robot's position, right? So as it's going back and forth, that's the horizontal position of the robot at the bottom of the screen. And time moving downward shows what the horizontal position was 
of the <coughs> robot at any given point in this particular trial. What do the straight black lines represent? It's like the location of the falling disks. It's the, the position of the falling disks, exactly. So again, their horizontal position. What happens when one of these black lines terminates? What does that mean? Why is it a line segment rather than a line? Because the disk goes off the screen and it gets the same x distance as the robot. Maybe. Maybe it hit the same x position as the robot or maybe not, depending on whether it caught it. Like it what happened when the line terminates? They're on the same horizontal line. They're on the same horizontal, which means the object got to the bottom of the screen, right? So when the line terminates, that particular object hits the ground. This one here, however, is still falling, right? So this takes a little bit to wrap your mind around because vertical position in this figure does not represent vertical position in the video game, right? In the, in the screen. Remember, it's, it's time. So what does it mean? So the, uh, a lower straight line here represents the object that hit last, right, or hit second. OK. What do the trapezoids represent? Yes? Um, the field of vision graphs. I'm saying that because the robot seemed to swivel, but that was in the 3D one, so. Uh, that's right. So the, the, the robot does not swivel in these simpl simplified simulations. Right. Remember, it has these seven ray sensors. It does actually represent the robot's field of view, but why a trapezoid? Why is the field of view narrowing as time that, goes on? Is that could be where the disk could be in the uh, simulation? Could be. Where it can see when it catches it. What, what it can see when it catches it, or what it can see at that point in time, right? So the cone, the field of view of the robot is a cone. So obviously, when the objects are up higher, there's a wider field of view that the robot has of that object, assuming that it actually does see it. The further the object falls, the narrower the, ra the horizontal range that the robot has for seeing that object. So that's why we have trapezoids, right? It's becoming narrower as, as it goes. Okay. What does it mean here that uh, the, the straight line meets up with the zigzag line at the end there? What happened at this point here? It caught, the, it caught the object. What happened the moment after it caught the object? It started moving towards the other object. You'll notice at exactly this point in time, the robot's position is inside the darker trapezoid. What does that mean? It can see the other it, object. It can see the other object. So the other object has been falling off to its right, but it's still within the robot's field of view, right? It's under the first object, grabs the first object. It can still see, quote unquote, the right-hand object heads over there, and what does it do for the remainder of the evaluation period? It gets under the second object. It gets under it and attracts it, right? It's, it's staying under it as the object is falling and then captures it. OK, so the robot did exactly what it's supposed to do in this case, in this simple case. There was no passing objects problem here. The first object that it caught was the one that was actually closer, closer to it when this evaluation period started. Right? The object was closer. That was the one that it caught first. As it was catching this one, it could still see the other one. So there was no object permanence problem. In this case, the robot didn't need memory whatsoever. Right? It can always see the object, and off it goes and catches it uh, when it needs to. All right. Let's have a look at uh, the same evolved CTRNN, but now we're going to expose it to a slightly more difficult issue, a, a slightly more difficult environment, which is now we have the passing objects problem. So similar to this one, but now this object, which 
uh, this object, which is going to hit the ground first, initially started higher than this object, which hit the ground last. What happened in this case? The robot's behavior is different in this slightly more challenging environment. What does the robot start out doing? Well, it starts out going to the one that's closer, and then swivels back to the one that's uh, higher. It kind of goes back and back and forth. Uh, back and forth, back and forth right? So these two objects are falling. It's kind of waving back and forth between them, right? The robot, again, quote unquote, is unsure about which object to chase after. What do you think the dotted horizontal line represents? Where the servant would want to go after. That's hard to say, right? We don't know when the robot determines anything. Right? Remember, this is a C tier and N. Inside this robot are just a bunch of neurons that are continuously changing values. We don't know when it decides anything. What is the dotted line representing? Where the objects pass. Where the objects actually pass. So at this point in time, the objects are exactly the same height above the robot. After this point, or below this line, this object represented by the lighter trapezoid, is now actually closer to the robot. So again, we can't know when the robot actually makes a decision here. What does it do after the two objects pass one another? It kind of hones in on the first object. It homes in on the first one, the one to its left, right? But kind of slowly, it still seems to be going back and forth between them. Who knows what's happened, right? The, it might have actually, again, quote unquote, made a decision. May have already locked in a, uh, a, a, a neural <laughs> dynamics that's going to cause it to go over to the left. But it takes its time to do so, right? It's not really in a hurry. It leisurely makes its way over there and grabs the object uh, in the right place at the right time. And then, like in the first case, it tracks over to the right stays underneath the second object and successfully catches that one. So far, so good, right? OK, so now let's look at the converse case. We're not going to have passing objects in this case, but we are going to have the object permanence problem. So at the beginning, the two objects start to fall. And like before, the robot is sort of sweeping back and forth between the two objects. It then decides or figures out which one is going to hit first, which is the object that actually started on the left but is falling to the right. What happens when it catches this object over here to the right? Can it see the second object? No. How do you know that it can't see it? Because the trapezoids, right? You'll notice that the robot at this point is no longer inside the darker trapezoid. In order to see the second object, the robot would have to be sitting at one of these horizontal positions. It's not. It's way too far uh, off to the right. Despite the fact that it caught the object and it doesn't see anything at this point, what does it do? Moves left, right? And it moves left at quite a quite a clip, right? It's got to get way over to the right and, and catch an object that is still far, or sorry, get off over to the left to catch an object that is falling to the left and gets there uh, in plenty of time and catches the object. So we know that this robot has memory somehow and has remembered where the object is. All right, let's make things even harder on our evolved C tier and N. Now we're going to have the passing objects problem and the object permanence problem. So this object here starts falling uh, from higher above this object. The robot does pretty much what it did before because, of course, in the first few time steps of this evaluation period, the world looks exactly the same to the robot here as it did up here. But then things start to change. The objects pass one another at the dotted line here. And the robot quickly figures out which one is going to hit first, grabs that one. Can it see the other object at this point? 
No, because it's outside the darker trapezoid and heads like heck over to the right and catches the other <coughs> object just in time. So the robot is juggling a lot of mental uh, challenges in this, in this case. Okay, let's look at the even more difficult case. So we have the passing objects problem and the object permanence problem here. Why is this case more difficult than the fourth case? Try and interpret this figure and tell from the figure why this is more difficult for the robot. You can only ever see one object at a time. There's a very short period of time, very, very brief, right here where the two trapezoids overlap. And lucky for the robot, it's sitting right in that spot. So it can see both objects for a very short period of time. What does it do at that point? What information does it need to pull out of that visual scene during those few brief moments? Which one is going to hit first? Which one is going to hit first? And it figures out that the one that's going to hit first is the one that's higher, right? So it's definitely not relying on this simple trick of saying, I'm going to chase after whichever one is, is closer, right? It starts to track to the left, chasing the left-hand object, which is already, which is, is higher than... Uh, the object on its on its right. How does it know? What information is available to know that the left object is going to hit first? The rate at which you're changing which sensors you're blocking. The, the rate at which the sensors are being blocked by the objects that are falling, right? It's somehow figuring out that there are two objects and one of them happens to be falling faster and it's falling sufficiently faster than this object is falling. So it has to calculate relative velocity and decides to go after this one, right? And starts chasing after it long before this one passes this one. All right, it's so over here, catches this one, and it hasn't seen the darker object since just at the beginning of the evaluation period, right? It's got a very good memory, tracks back at exactly the right angle, or it tracks back at exactly the right velocity, and catches the object just in time, right? A minimal robot, not very sophisticated, it's a circle, but it's doing some pretty sophisticated things that if we were to see an animal do this, we would say, this is a relatively smart animal. Why is it so much better on that last one than the first one that just sighted at the beginning. Why is it so much better in this case than it is in this case? Yeah. Good question. Why are you so fast and efficient uh, at moving out of the way of a falling boulder that's about to hit you? You don't have the luxury of time, right? Here, clearly the robot can move fast if it needs to, but if there's no pressure, if there's no time pressure to move quickly, then take your time, right? So maybe this robot has already decided, remember there's square code quotes around all these cognitive terms here, we don't, we don't actually know when or how the robot's deciding. It may have already decided which one it is, but there's no pressure. There's nothing in the fitness function that says track the object all the time. All the robot has to do is get there at the right time, right? So it takes its time and gets over there when it needs to. Here, when it needs to move quickly, it's, it's over there, right? It's already made the decision, over it, over it goes. Okay, that's selective attention. All right, so again, the reading for lecture, uh, lecture nine here, we'll walk you through these four experiments again. We're gonna switch now to our final lecture in this minimal cognition series. And we're gonna look now at a fifth uh, a fifth aspect of cognition, which is known as active categorical perception, or ACP. So uh, we haven't talked about categorical perception too much yet, but forming categories as you look around the world is extremely important. And again, thinking about thinking is misleading. It's extremely difficult, right? It's trivial, or it feels trivial for you to look at all the objects in this room and immediately categorize them as desk, chair, laptop, student, and so on. 
But if you think about it, all of the perceptions that you're making or all the sensations that are impinging on your sensorium at the moment, they're all continuous, right? There is a flood of photons that are falling on your retina. There's pressure information on your skin uh, and so on. It's all continuous information. There's no discrete categories there. But you do not perceive the world as a continuous wash of color and pressure and pain and pleasure and so on. You see the world as made up of discrete categories. Where do those categories come from? How do you form, how do you learn those categories? And then once you have, how do you recognize things out in the world and assign them to the appropriate category? It's an extremely mysterious phenomenon, and no one is really sure how humans or animals actually do this. So let's investigate a robot now that tries to do this. And this robot is going to do it in a particular way. So it's going to try and categorize its world actively. OK, what does that mean? Well, as we talked about when we talked about uh, embodied cognition, the fact that you have a body is a tool for you to learn about the world. So we're going to look at a robot now that literally pushes against the world and feels how the world pushes back. And that action-reaction feedback loop is going to allow the robot to form categories. And it's going to do it by trying to force particular kinds of change in what it's actually feeling. And the kind of change that it's going to try and force is it's going to try and reduce within category differences. So things that initially might feel the same, the robot is going to move in such a way that objects that belong to the same class feel similar. And it's going to try and magnify between category differences. So as this object, gra as this robot grasps objects which belong to different classes, it's going to manipulate those objects in a way so that the feeling generated by these objects that belong to different classes are magnified. All right, we'll look at that in a moment. Here's a way to build up your intuition for, for this idea. If you look at these objects here, you can see that there's, there's a continuum from round objects to increasingly edged objects. There's no categories here. There's just a continuum, right? We could have an infinite number in this series. But let's imagine that I asked you to manipulate these objects to induce categories. The categories don't exist in the objects themselves. There's no categories here. But if I was to put a blindfold on you and place you in front of these objects and ask you to separate the round ones from the edged ones, how would you do it? Um, so if there was a flat surface nearby, I would place one on the table and maybe push it. If it's round, it would roll. Um, the more edged it would be, the harder it would be. Absolutely. So take each of the objects, put them on a flat surface and tap them, or put your palm on the top of the object and r try and roll the object. Uh, how do we do this with that? So like that example uh, takes or uses affordance uh, because you know, circles have the property of being able to roll, but boxes don't. Like, do we, do we need all of the other minimal cognition things to do this? It seems like... You do not need all the other... You do not need all the other cognitive building blocks to do this, right? We could just take a robot, put its hand on top of the object, and program the arm to go back and forth. Maybe the robot isn't even sensing what happens. But, the, but the, the, just the fact that the robot is interacting with the object, the interaction is what is going to cause the categories to form, right? Depending on the robot, depending on the surface we put the objects, depending on whether the objects are smooth or rough, at some point, the robot is going to be able to roll them. It's going to be able to roll this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. But maybe by the time it gets to this one, suddenly there is a discrete jump, right? The object no longer rolls, but now it slides as the robot pushes it. So where the category forms, the actual discrete dividing line between round and edged objects, 
depends on the interaction, but it will, it will emerge. Right? It's this interaction that gives rise to these categories. This is another thing that makes thinking about thinking misleading. Right? We look out in the world, there are these discrete categories that are out there. But the more you think about it, those categories, the meaning of those categories really comes about from their affordances, right? the way you're able to interact with those objects. <coughs> OK, so let's, uh, let's have a look at our robot. This is no longer a minimal robot. We're now getting into some pretty complex uh, robots. Here's the reading for today. The title of the paper is ACP in an Evolved Anthropomorphic Robotic Arm. So anthropomorphic means in the shape or, or in the shape of a human. So we don't have a full humanoid robot in this case. We have a pretty complex robot arm, however. So here's the arm. And what the experimenters are going to do is they're going to place one of two objects in front of the robot. Either they're going to place a sphere, or they're going to place an ellipsoid in which the minor and major axes are so close in length to one another that it's almost a circle. But you can see by looking at these that it's not a circle. Right? There's a circle here and an ellipse, but it's going to be tricky for the robot to distinguish between these objects because the difference between the two of them is pretty, pretty slight. Okay. All right, so what they're going to do is they're going to evaluate each C tier and N's. They're going to do the same trick we've seen before. They're going to evolve a population of C tier and N's. They're going to take each C tier and N, drop it into the robot 16 times. The first eight times, they're going to start with the robot's arm in position A, and they're going to put the, the robot's palm on the top of the object. And they're then going to place this object under the robot's hand. And they're going to do it a second time in position A with the ellipse under the robot's hand, a third time with this object, a fourth time with the same ellipse, but now rotated a little bit. So they're trying to make the object seem different, but it's still the same, same object. So they're going to evaluate the CTRNA eight times with the robot starting in position A, and then they're going to put the same eight conditions. Uh, they're going to evaluate the same eight conditions with the robot's hand in position B. So 16 evaluations. And they're going to then devise a fitness function that will reward for robots that can tell us when it's actually in the presence of the sphere and when it's actually in the presence of the ellipsoid. So far, so good. OK, so let's have a look at the arm now for a moment. You can see J1 through J8. So there are seven rotational joints, not unlike the joints you're going to create now in assignment six. You can see there are two joints in the shoulder, which allow this motion and this motion. We have a third motion in our shoulder, which is twisting. They do that using J3, which they put in the upper arm, which allows the arm to twist along its long axis. What is the joint normal for J3? They're connecting this kind of upper part of the upper arm to the lower part of the upper arm with J3 to allow twisting along the long axis. What's the joint normal for J3? along the direction of the arm itself, right? So if you think about the joint normals for J1 and J2, if J1 is supposed to do this, the joint normal points upwards for J1. If, uh, let's see, that's J1. If J2 is supposed to cause this action, then the joint normal should point along this axis. And because there's two of them there, it allows this motion at the shoulder, and the joint normal in J3, which points along the arm, allows twisting along the long axis. OK, one joint at the elbow, just like us. Um, another J5 at the forearm that allows twisting of the hand relative to the lower arm, and two joints in the wrist, uh, again, just like us, and then a whole bunch of motorized joints in the hand. There's a whole bunch of motorized joints, 
but these are all going to be controlled together. So all the motors in the hand are going to either flex into a fist or extend into an open hand. Okay, I think we'll flip back and forth between this slide which shows the robot's body and this one that shows its brain. So um, we are going to be using CTRNNs again. So this formula should look relatively familiar to you. But as you can see, it's slightly different. So let's talk about the modifications they've made here. Here's the visual representation of the CTRNN for this robot. Again, looks similar to what you've seen before. There's a sensor layer down below, a hidden layer in the middle here, and then an output layer at the top. Let's start with the motors, which are a little easier to understand. You'll notice that 31 through, uh, neuron 31 through 44 gives us 14 neurons, and those are for the seven <coughs> joints in the arm. Why 14 neurons for seven joints? <coughs> So when I want to flex or extend my elbow, there's one joint, but there are two sets of muscles, right? My bicep and my tricep. There are two muscles that are controlling one joint, more or less. This is a gross simplification of human anatomy here. Why two muscles for one joint? What's the point of the bicep-tricep combination? in one direction, one pulls it the other direction. One pulls in one direction, bicep pulls this way, the tricep, when I tense my tricep, pulls my uh, lower arm in the other direction, right? So what they've set up in this neural model here is an agonist, agonist antagonistic, antagonistic muscle pair. So in essence here, each pair of neurons is assigned to one of the joints, and when one of those neurons fires, it's pulling the joint in one direction. So the two neurons, when they're firing, they're both kind of pulling on the joint. What happens when I flex both my tricep and my bicep? So if I do one or the other, it rotates my arm, what happens if I tense both? Under what conditions do I want to tense both? Why would I do so? Because you want to impress the ladies. You want to impress the ladies, perhaps. That's one good reason, yes. Aside from that, a very important Darwinian reason, definitely. Other reasons for wanting to do so. Just to hold something. To hold something. In right. spot, in it, space. Exactly, right? So I'm holding a heavy object in front of me. I don't want my lower arms to rotate, right? I want to hold something in place, so I'm flexing both the agonist muscle group and the antagonistic muscle group, right? So we've seen the CTRNN before, but the way in which the motor neurons here are kind of pulling on the joint is a little bit different from what we've seen before. They put it in because they wanted to try and make this anthropomorphic, make it as much like human anatomy as, as possible or at least more than some of the simpler <coughs> models we've seen before. Okay, 14 motor neurons controlling, uh, controlling the arm, and in the hand, we have just two motors um, that are pulling, that are trying to either flex the hand or open the hand, right? And they can both pull at the same time. So one agonist antagonistic muscle pair for the hand. Neurons 47 and 48 are special. We'll talk about those in a moment. Let's switch to the uh, sensor side. We've seen this before. The seven neurons here are proprioceptive sensors. So the values arriving at the input here are reporting the current angle of the seven joints in the arm. Straightforward. The 10, the 10 tactile sensors that we have here are giving information about touch in the hand. And there should be, yes, if you see in the hand, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 tactile sensors. They return one 
if something is touching that part of the hand, and they return zero if nothing is touching that part of the hand. Why so much, why so many tactile sensors in the hand? Um, well, it's our main uh, interact, you know, it's the main thing that it'll interact with and be outside the world. And also, um, it's kind of like the light. So if the ball is going to roll, it'll go across many different sensors. But if it's going to stay flat, then it won't go across any. Uh, but, you know, obviously the more sensors, the better. The more sensors, the better, right? It's going to have to distinguish between two objects which have very similar geometries. And it's also going to have to distinguish between the same object which seems to have different geometries, right? You better have some pretty good uh, sensation in your hand to be able to make these subtle distinctions. Okay. So we've got tactile sensors in the hand, and we also have uh, proprioceptive sensors in the hand. So we have, how many, 18, 19, 20, we've got five proprioceptive sensors in the hand, which are on here somewhere, uh, which give us information about the angle of the five fingers. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay, let's try and tackle the equations then that describe how these neurons change over time. So we've got, um, we've got sensors, uh, we've got uh, our differential equations. We have 48 differential equations because we have 48 neurons in this CTRNN. The first 22 differential equations are tau sub i, y dot sub i equals minus y plus g i sub i. It's a much simplified differential equation. Why this simplified differential equation for the first 22? Remember that y sub i dot is reporting how the value of neuron i is changing over time. It's a function of tau, which we've seen before. So these first 22 neurons can change quickly or slowly. They are going to decay back to a default value of zero. But they won't always get to zero because this term may be pulling them away from zero. What is this term doing? It's this terrible notation where we have uppercase i sub lowercase i. What does the uppercase I represent? What does it stand for? The sensor value. It's the sensor value or the input, right? So each of these 22 neurons <coughs> is attached to the outside world. It's attached to a proprioceptive sensor or a tactile sensor. It's getting input from the outside world. So I sub I for neurons 8 through 17 is going to be set to 1 or 0, depending on whether that part of the hand is touching the object or not. In the first seven uh, sensors, I sub I is going to be set to the actual angle of that joint in the arm. Right? That's where the sensor values are actually coming in to the CTRNN. What's G? I think this should actually be G sub I. I think it's a mistake here. Let's assume it's G sub I. What did G sub I do in the CTRNN that we looked at last week? Gain. It's the gain, right? And we're going to place these gains as well as these towels under evolutionary control. Let's imagine we evolved a CTRNN and we found that all the G, the G sub I's for the first seven neurons had been reduced by evolution to zero. What would that tell us about what evolution is doing? We evolve a CTRNN, the arm successfully distinguishes between the sphere and the ellipsoid. We break open the CTRNN, the evolved CTRNN, and we see that the gains for the first seven sensor neurons are all zero. What is evolution telling us? They're unused. They're unused. They're useless for distinguishing the shape of, distinguishing between the shapes of these two objects. 
We'd be really surprised if the gains for all of these had been reduced to zero, right? We're pretty sure that at least some tactile information is going to be important for distinguishing between spheres and ellipsoids. Okay, so now we have for the remaining 23 through 48 neurons, 23 through 48, we're going to use the familiar formula that we've seen before. There's no I sub I here because, of course, these neurons are not receiving any sensory information or any input from the outside world. We've got our taus. We've got our weights that describe how, how neuron J influences neuron I. And we have beta in this case, which is the bias, B for beta, B for bias, how we're biasing Y sub J here. And we're going to iterate for each of the neurons here. So let's just take neuron 23, for example. You can see that for neuron 23, we're going to iterate over J that's going to range between 1 and 30. What does that mean? So neuron 23 is going to be influenced by neurons 1 through 30. Which neurons is it being influenced by? What are those neurons here? All the sensor neurons, 1 through 22, and, and all the internal ones. Is it including itself in this case? Is there a self-connection? Yeah. Of course, right? So in this set, there is a W2323, right? It's being influenced by itself. So the hidden neurons, they are all innervated, or they're receiving neural values from all the sensors and all the hidden neurons. So we have recurrent connections in there. Recurrent connections are a hint. What's the hint? What do they, what do they give to the robot? Memory, if it needs it. Does the robot need memory for this task? Who knows? Not clear. The investigator just threw it in in case it's useful. OK. Neurons, uh, neurons 31 through 48, which are our output neurons, they are receiving neural influence only from neurons 23 through 30. Which ones are those? <clears throat> Just, the Just the internal ones, right? So this mathematics here tells us that the output neurons do not receive uh, input directly from the sensor neurons. It's only indirectly through the internal neurons. <coughs> so if you're still a little bit confused about the differential equations for describing CJNs, this is a great slide to go back and forth between the geometrical representation and the mathematical representation so you understand what all the bits here are, are actually doing. Sound good? Okay, we have not talked about neurons 47 and 48. Let's talk about those now. And I'm going to talk you through this slide, but before I do, let's actually try and represent what neurons 47 and 48 are doing graphically. And I'm going to create for you what's called a phase diagram or a phase portrait. When we talked about CTRNNs last week, we drew another graph here where we showed how the value of a given neuron changes over time. In a phase portrait, we can look at how two or more values change over time relative to one another. So what we're going to do in this case is we're going to look at how neuron 47, y sub 47, and how neuron y, uh, neuron 48, y sub 48, change over time. We're going to drop the CTRNN into our robot. Our robot's going to start moving and doing its thing. We're going to update our differential equations, which is going to cause neuron 47 and 48 to change over time. Let's draw what they're doing. So in a phase diagram, every point here represents a, a particular combination of values for 47 and 48. Let's assume that at t sub 0, at the first time step in which the C, a given CTRNN is evaluated, that's the first time step, 
Let's imagine that neuron 47 starts with an initial value of 0, and, an, and neuron 48 also starts with an initial value of 0. We update the simulation of the robot, and we update the differential equations by one time step. And now 47 and 48 take on new values at time step t sub 1. We update the simulation again. They change in value again and again and again and again. And if we connect all of these dots together, we get a picture that looks something like this. We have a continuous line inside this phase diagram or phase portrait, which is telling us how the two neurons change their values over time. So far, so good? Okay, I've written y sub 47 and y sub 48 here as just shorthand, but remember when we read out the value of a neuron, the output of 47 is actually computed by this whole term here, because the activation function here will squash this neuron down to a value between minus 1 and plus 1. Right? So we know that the value of 47 and 48 are always ranging between minus 1 and plus 1. Any questions so far? Okay. So now, how are we going to represent exactly, how, how are we going to allow the robot to tell us whether it's in the presence of a sphere or an ellipsoid? We're going to do that by looking at what are the values of 47 and 48 during the last 5% of the evaluation period. So the robot's allowed to do its thing, and in the last 5% of the time, so 0.95 uppercase T, so uppercase T is the last time step of the simulation. Let's say we update the robot a thousand time steps, so it would be the last, whatever that is, let's make it easier, uh, fifth, the last 50 time steps. Okay. What is the value of neuron 47 and 48 during those last few time steps? I'm going to just try and embolden this line here to represent the last 5 last 5% 5 of the time step, right? So it started here, did this, and right at the end the values were, were these. Okay. Let's have a look and let's find the minimum value of 47 neuron 47 during those time steps. So we're looking at all the horizontal positions of these dots, and there's the minimum value of 47. So far, so good. And we also want the minimum value of 48 during that time period. So we look at the vertical components of all of these coordinates, and there's the minimum height of any of those points. So the minimum of 48 is right there. And now we do the same thing in that same time period. But now in that time period, we're looking for the maximum value that 47 and 48 took on. So if we look at 47, its, uh, it's maximum value is here. Let's draw a line here. And the maximum value of 48, the maximum vertical component, is here. OK. All right, so what do we have now? We have a minimum bounding box, or we have a, a bounding box representing all of the points here. So we actually have a rectangle that's drawn inside the phase diagram. Okay, so whenever we place a sphere, S, or an ellipsoid, D, every time we do that, it produces changing values in 47 and 48. We we do this computation, we get back for that object one rectangle. All right, we take the object away, we put the arm back to position A, we put a new object underneath the robot, we erase our phase diagram, we start at zero, zero again, and the robot starts to move again in the presence of a new object. Does it draw exactly the same trajectory? Do neurons 47 and 48 trace out exactly the same line? No? Why not? Uh, just because it's the other neurons are firing. 
The other neurons are not firing randomly. There's no randomness in this experiment. We place a new object. Does it draw the same trajectory here? What we're drawing are the values of these two neurons up here. Are these two, the values of these two neurons, do they do exactly the same thing when we place a new object under its palm? I mean, hopefully not, um, because the difference represents uh, whether it's categorizing them. So if it's doing the same thing every time, then we clearly failed. That's it. So we don't want it to do the same thing every time, right? We have the same brain, we have the same C to an N, but we're placing new objects underneath it, which causes new sensation, which causes new influence on the internal neurons, which cause new influence on the output neurons, including the categorization neurons, and it will trace a different trajectory when we place a different object underneath it. So every time we place one of these objects, we get one of these rectangles embedded in the phase portrait. And remember that we're exposing each C tier and N to 16 different objects. It's not actually all 16 different objects. Sometimes we're giving it the same object. But we're doing this 16 times. So I'm going to erase this now. And instead of showing you the trajectory, I'm just going to show you the rectangles. So we place object 1, and we get one rectangle. We place object 2, and we get a different rectangle defined by neurons 47 and 48. We put object 3, and we get a third rectangle, and so on. Now the investigators, or the computer, knows which of these 16 objects corresponds to the sphere, and which of the 16 objects corresponds to the ellipsoid. So the computer then creates a minimum bounding box that spans all of the R sub S E, which are all of the rectangles produced by the sphere. Let's imagine that object 2 and object 3 were both, uh, were both spheres. So the minimum bounding box is the one that just contains <coughs> all of the rectangles produced by O2 and O3. Let's imagine that O1 was one of the ellipsoids. And let's create O4, which was also one presentation of the ellipsoids. We put a bounding box around these two, and we get this bounding box. So far, so good. So uh, C sub S now is going to be the bounding box, which is the category associated with spheres. And C sub D here is going to be the bounding box that spans all of the experiences with the ellipsoid. We want the robot to categorize or distinguish between cylinder uh, between spheres and ellipsoids. We, the only thing left to talk about is the fitness function. We take a C tier and N, we put it in the robot, the robot does its thing, we do these computations. At the end of these computations, we have just two things, C sub S and C sub D. These are going to be incorporated now into the fitness function. How would you incorporate C sub S and C sub D into the fitness function to evolve C tier and Ns that distinguish between S's and D's? Um, try to get the maximum area between the boxes, you know, the box that is ellipsoids, ellipsoids and the box that is spheres. The, the maximum area, what difference, did you say? Difference. Difference in what sense? Can you so, be a little bit more so, specific? Um, like, the ellipsoid will contain the sphere. I, you know, it should, presumably. But, um... Should it? Well, okay, it shouldn't. It, it would be best if it didn't, but... Oh, okay. okay. It would be best if it didn't, that's so the right. The maximum difference between the area of the ellipsoid box and the sphere box. The maximum difference between these two boxes, right? right? If these two boxes, if C sub S and C sub D are perfectly overlapping one another, they're exactly the same, what does that tell us about that particular C tier and N? Does it know the difference between, doesn't know the difference between spheres and ellipsoids? Okay, so here we go. Here's our fitness function, FF. It's made up of F1 plus F2. So there's two terms. Let's have a look at these two terms. Let's start with F1. That's a little bit easier. 
We're going to do a summation over all the uh, E's here. So these are all the 16 environments or evaluations, if you like, that we present to the robot. And we're going to sum up 1 minus D sub E over D sub max. Let's start with D sub E over D sub max. Why that ratio? What is D? D sub E is the Euclidean distance between the object and the center of the palm of the robot's hand. Why D sub E over D sub max? D sub max is the maximum possible distance that the robot can move its palm from the object. What does that ratio then tell us? The proximity to the object. The proximity to the object, right? How close is the palm to, uh, to that object? That's right. So if that ratio is zero, in essence, the palm is touching the object. OK, why 1 minus that? Uh, the closer it is, the higher the value. The closer it is, the higher the value, right? So if the, if the robot's palm is actually in contact with the object, this ratio of 0, 1 minus 0 is 1. That's the best you can do. Let's imagine that we, play, we start by placing the robot's palm on the object. We turn on the CR, CTRNN and the robot does this. Rotates its arm to D sub max. What happens in this case? What's the ratio? It's one, right? D sub max over D sub max is one. One minus one is zero. So the worst possible thing the robot can do is this. Best possible thing it can do is this. And to do this for all uppercase E equals 16 environments. OK, so we're trying to maximize F1 to start with. So if we maximize F1, we get F1 to 1. We evolve the CTRNNs, and we evolve a CTRNN that gets an F1 of 1. What does that mean the robot's doing? It's keeping its palm in contact with all of the 16 objects. OK. So uh, the first thing we're trying to do is make sure that the robot actually physically touches the, the object. right? It doesn't have a camera. It doesn't have these ray sensors like the previous robot. If it takes its hand off the object, that's it. it. It can't know what the object is. It has to actively manipulate the object, thus the active in active categorical perception. OK. Assuming that it does get an F1, uh, if it gets an F1 of less than 1, it gets nothing for F2. So we're not going to worry about F2 until the robot has evolved the ability to maintain contact with all 16 objects. Once it does, once we get an F1 equal to 1, we're going to give it additional points through F2. Anybody, can anyone walk me through the intuition of F2 here? It's based on what you were saying. <coughs> What's the idea here? Let's work from the inside out. This is the intersection between CS and CD. Right, so how much are these two blocks overlapping? So in this cartoon here, here's the intersection between C sub S and C sub D. We're taking that area and we're uh, dividing, uh, we're dividing it by the minimum of the area of either C sub S or C sub D. Take the overall area of these two and take the minimum and put that on the denominator. Why do that? Yes? So that's like the ratio of how much of the smaller one is overlapping with the bigger one? Exactly. And so if you had the smaller one entirely within the bigger one, the area of overlap might not be that big, but it's useless. It's, that's right, exactly. So let's draw this. So if we have, uh, let's say, C sub D, C sub D is huge, C sub S is very small, and it's completely contained within C sub D, this is no good, right? The robot cannot distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids. So this is as equally bad, or should be as equally bad, as 
CS and CD being exactly the same size and perfectly overlapping. So this ratio here makes sure that these two situations get exactly the same value, which is what? Once you do the 1 minus, right? So these two situations here, that ratio corresponds to 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So that's the worst possible thing a CTRNN can do. What is the best possible thing it can do? You want it they were completely separate. That's right. You want to minimize the overlap, right, or maximize the difference between them. Does it matter the actual Euclidean distance between these categories? Doesn't matter, right? Just make sure that these bounding boxes are not overlapping. Okay, so let's summarize what we just talked about. Uh, this fitness function says keep your eye on the prize or your hand on the ball and move in such a way that you can distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids. I think we're out of time, so we'll save the video for class on Thursday. We have a quiz due tonight. Good luck with assignment six. Thank you.